getting things started I we're going to officially begin our um, hearing so just wanted to let you all know for the record um, my name is Julia Mejia City Councilor at large I happen to also be the chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on Education this hearing is being recorded and will be broadcasted on Xfinity R, Xfinity 8 RCN 82 Verizon 964 and streamed at boston.gov slash cities slash council slash TV. We'll be taking public testimony at the end of this hearing. If you are testifying and interested in doing so um, with us here today, you could do it in the chamber um, by signing up in the sheet below next to the door. Or if you are interested in um, signing up virtually, please email central staff liaison Megan Kavanaugh at megan.kavanaugh at boston.gov for the link. Written comments may also be sent to the committee at ccc.education at boston.gov or to central staff liaison. Please keep in mind that in any, that any um, submitted comments will be made a part of the record and available to all counselors. The subject of this hearing is docket 1240, order for a hearing on the Green New Deal for BPS plans and a specific plan to merge six schools into three and split each of them into two, onto two campuses. This matter was sponsored by myself and Councilor Lara and was referred to the committee on October the 5th, 2022. Today, I am joined by my colleagues in the order of arrival, Councilor President Ed Flynn and Councilor Liz Braden. This afternoon, as always, um, and I also like to acknowledge my uh, colleague, Councilor at Large, Louis Lijian. Louis Jean. This afternoon, we'll lead with the community panel. After the hearing their testimony, we will um, move on to the administration panel, where then we'll do a round of questions for both. Okay? Because I'm keeping everyone held hostage here today. Um, after that, we'll allow for um, some questions from my colleagues and myself. Um, and I just wanted to make note that before we begin that um, my colleague, Councillor Lara, who is also the co-sponsor of this hearing, was not feeling well and will not be joining us here today, but just wanted to let you know that uh, she sends her regards. So in the interest of the way that I, and I just need to make sure that all of my uh, and I'm sure that Louis, Ju, uh, Megan or someone will have let me know if all of the folks who are part of the community panel are here. Megan Wolf is a member of Quest, which stands for Quality Education for Every Student. Ruby Reyes, who is the director of Beja, the Boston Education Justice Alliance. We have Edith Bazil, who is not here yet, and I'm wondering if she will be um, being zoomed in, and we just need to know if that's the case. Allison Friedman is a member of the school parent council at the Sumner Elementary, right over there. Uh, we have Brenda uh, Ramsey, a parent leader at the Shaw Elementary School, which I believe will be uh, participating via Zoom. Yeah, okay. And John Mudd, who is a board member of the Boston Network for um, the Black Student Achievement. So I just wanted to make sure that those folks who are signed up are either here I know you all are here, but those who are in Zoom will get to you as well. Wanted to also make note that we are going to, um, in the interest of making sure that everybody has a voice and able to uh, get through this, I'm going to ask everyone to be really clear and concise, and you have three minutes each. Um, so we're saying that with understanding that you will go over, so you really have five, okay? Don't stress out. We got you. All right, so let's begin. Uh, Megan, you now have the floor. And I'm going to set the timer. I just want to note that um, Edith Bazil um, had a family emergency, and so Ruby is going to be doing her testimony for her. Apologies. Okay. No, no, no worries. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councillor Mejia and members of the City Council. Thank you for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to speak. My name is Megan Wolf. I'm the parent of two BPS graduates, a longtime member of Quest, and an active member in the Build BPS, now Green New Deal, coalition. The coalition is a collection of parent, educator, and community groups that have been working together regarding facilities decisions since 2018. We share a commitment to equity and a belief that all students should have access to high quality educational facilities regardless of their race, educational needs, neighborhood, or the school they attend. 
We believe that transparency is critical to any planning process regarding our schools. And we believe, based on an abundance of research, that school closings across the United States disproportionately harm black and brown students. Many of us testifying today have been through multiple school closures and facilities planning processes over the years, and I'd like to share a little bit of that history as context for where we are today with the Green New Deal and the mergers, mergers under discussion today. Do you know the Choate Burnham, Charles Logue, or Audubon schools? Probably not, because these were among the 90 schools closed between 1974 and 2009 in Boston, 90 schools. It was a period of mass closures and is why tens of thousands of Boston residents walk by senior housing, condominium complexes, and in some cases charter schools and think, that was my school. I won't bore you with the details of that period, but let's jump to 2014 when Boston Public Schools paid $660,000 for a district audit by McKinsey and Company at the request of Mayor Walsh. The report looked at how BPS could achieve greater efficiency and made a slew of recommendations that included limiting special education services to save money, outsourcing paraprofessional positions to save money, and closing up to 40% 40, 40 of Boston schools. The report was done quietly and a short summary presentation was presented at school committee. It wasn't until a year later, though, that the full 222 pages of recommendations were revealed publicly after a Freedom of Information Act request by Quest. Interestingly, prior to the release of the full McKinsey report, Mayor Walsh had inadvertently revealed plans to close over 30 schools in a private meeting with Quest, a statement he later denied having made, but which was confirmed by the number proposed in the McKinsey report. The whole McKinsey and Walsh affair left many in Boston's education community skeptical about facilities planning. This skepticism led to another FOIA request for internal communications between City Hall and Boston Public Schools about facilities plans. Hundreds of emails were released, many about the implementation of McKinsey's recommendations and with lots of language about, quote, reworking the verbiage regarding school closings and not using the word closing anywhere. They call the next stage of facilities planning the 2.0 of the McKinsey report and the, quote, mechanism through which they would right-size the district. In early 2015, Mayor Walsh rolled out BPS, the 10-year educational facilities master plan. As Councillor Mejia said in a recent public meeting regarding the Green New Deal, sometimes being a BPS constituent is like being an abused partner. You keep going back because you think and hope things are going to change. And this is how many of us entered Bill, P Bill BPS, with optimism, because $1 billion is a lot of money and because Build BPS facilities have been in dire need of upgrades for many years. And Build BPS was no fly-by-night operation. Detailed evaluations of all Build B BPS buildings were done. There were focus groups, subcommittees, general public meetings, and many of us participated in a lot of these. Despite all this fanfare, Build BPS never produced a long-range facilities plan, facilities and educational plan. There was no timeline, no promised equity analysis, no impact analysis, and even to this day, no financial reckoning of that $1 billion. And most, most importantly, there were no new buildings out of that plan, though a number of schools did close. So this is how we enter this round of facilities planning, mergers, and the Green New Deal. This is the history that makes many of us skeptical and makes us ask, is the Green New Deal anything more than a rebranding of the long-term efforts to close schools? I want to say that I don't oppose school closures under all circumstances. Sometimes buildings are legitimately unsafe, and sometimes declining enrollment does require a review of the number of schools in the district. But too often, schools are targeted for closure because they're underperforming or underutilized, or because intentional disinvestment has, has created a school few would want their children to attend. But how can closures or even mergers be considered at this point without a full, transparent, and authentic process that asks and answers real questions about our schools, a process that shows respect for students, families, and educators who are affected most? I'll say that, uh, that BPS advertising for a senior project manager for, for school closings last December as Mayor, Mayor Wu took office, or releasing the Green New Deal without consulting, informing, or giving a clue to the Build BPS Coalition, 
literally centered on facilities, has not been a good place to start. Eve Ewing, in her book, Ghosts in the Schoolyard, Racism and School Closings on Chicago's South Side, recommends four questions that should be at the core of this kind of process. One asks, what is the history that has brought us to this moment? How can we learn more about the history from those who have lived it? What does this institution represent for those communities closest to it? And finally, and most importantly, who gets to make the decision here and how do power, race, and identity inform the answer to that question? <clears throat> without, without answering these questions, we are doomed to add to the tens of thousands of school closings in the United States, which dips place an average of a quarter of a million students each year. We're doomed to take away the schools of a disproportionately high number of African American students who experience school loss at a higher rate than students of other races. The closings of school in Boston would mean the loss of institutional fixtures in our neighborhoods, places that for many are a second home, places that families increasingly rely on for a wide range of supports, places that nurture the hopes and plans of our children. So Boston, let's ask the right questions and be candid about our intent. Let's have an honest accounting of who wins and who loses. Let's authentically engage those closest to the pain. Look before we leap plan before we act. We can and must do better than we have in the past because our schools and our students depend on us to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. That was beautifully put and really do appreciate it. And the only reason why you're lucky that I let you go extra is because Edith is not here, so you took up some of her time. Thank you. But I am going to say, don't try it, because I will gobble y'all in, okay? Really, we're trying to keep this moving. So five minutes, I'm gonna go next to uh, Ruby, I'm gonna let me start the timer here. You now have the floor. Um, I did have a few slides that I sent in. Oh. Um, We're they're... making exceptions for community <laughs> activists. <laughs> and activists. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just want you to know, don't get upset, BPS. There's different store, different norms for different folks. So, how many slides you have? Um, I sent the the Google Doc. I think over to Julissa. Yeah. So it's obvious. Yeah. Okay, so you're gonna consult. You're gonna do all of them. Well, some of them are for um, Sumner and Shaw as well. Okay. Uh, All right. So it's I just I want to start with um, just talking about Build BPS. Um, one of the things that Megan mentioned, I think, that was also missing from the comprehensive master facilities plan that Build BPS was supposed to be uh, was swing space and an educational plan for grade reconfigurations and for uh, student assignment and feeder patterns. So we know that when there's no swing space, it means that there will be school closures um, because there's no place to move a school community, um, so it is dissolved. Um, I wanna just talk a little bit about broken promises. For now, and for what we've seen historically, has been just a series of broken promises, not only from the city, but from Boston Public Schools, majority Boston Public Schools. Um, in 2019, the West Roxbury Educational Complex was closed suddenly. Um, those children were supposed, we were supposed to have an equity analysis of what happened to the young people that were impacted by this closure. To this date, we have not received anything. There was an autism strand program that was supposed to be moved intact um, to the Jeremiah Burke School. We don't know what happened to those young people. So that's just uh, one example. I also want to talk a little bit about the McCormick Middle School, which has had a series of broken promises. There was a proposed renovation to turn it into a 7 to 12 secondary school after it was attempted to be closed, um, along with the West Roxbury Educational Complex. They were told that if they had community input, their green fields would stay intact. Um, in fact, the school committee voted to give their Greenfields and space away in the beginning of a pandemic to the Dorchester Boys and Girls Club. To this day, they were told that they would have renovations done in order for their merger to be successful with the Boston, with BCLA. Um, many of those promised renovations never actually happened. And those young people and staff have come to school committee and shared that those renovations haven't actually happened. Um, the closure of middle schools was a decision that was passed in June of 2019, um, our school committee 
voted to do away with middle schools to move to a K6, 7, 12 structure. There was never a community process to uh, determine if that was a good choice, if it was scientifically backed. It was just a decision that was made and we were expected to move forward. As of right now, closures, mergers, and grade reconfigurations have happened to the West Roxbury Educational Complex, um, the Jackson Mann, Edwards, Timulty, Mission Hill, Irving schools. And the mergers include the McCormick BCLA, the Shaw Taylor, Sumner Philbrick, and grade reconfigurations were for, determined for the PA Shaw, the Blackstone, Sumner, Mendel, East Boston High School. Um, and new school buildings have been um, the Boston Arts Academy, which was a, a renovation. Um, none of these schools were, I think, in the original Build BPS plan. So clearly it was not a comprehensive master facilities plan. Um, the reason for this hearing is because we, there was an announcement in November of this year that there would be several mergers between the Shaw and Taylor, the Sumner Philbrick, the Clapp and the Russell. Um, there was an announcement that the Clapp and the Russell merger would not take place. To this day, there's been no explanation as to why this merger was canceled or why the others should take place. This hearing is an example of how there's been no community process in terms of just sharing information. And we, I think many of us asked for this hearing so that there would be some sort of political measures being taken um, in such an egregious system of not holding families at the center of their work. Um, the Green New Deal, uh, which was started by Mayor Michelle Wu as a rebrand of Build BPS, continues to not include many of the things that Megan um, mentioned, and also um, we're still waiting for our equity plan around what happened to the young people in West Roxbury. Um, and so I will say that as part of the Build BPS Coalition, our demands that started with build BPS and continue to this day because those demands have not been met, is a moratorium on school closures and major facility decisions until there's a master facilities plan. Um, and there's no divestment of school properties, land, or breaking up of school communities should a community need to move into proven safety reasons. Um, authentic community engagements about the decisions in the future of our city's schools. Um, and I just wanted to share with parents uh, for those listening, that if your school is under threat of closure or merger without any kind of communication or um, you know, you've had sh spotty communication like what's happened with some of the schools where they'll have a meeting one day and then you know, not have a translation available, um, that families can talk to other school communities that this is happening to, talk to the media to share their stories, give testimony at school committee and city council hearings, and just work really hard to let the community and folks know how egregious they've been treated and what their school communities want. Um, I wanna just also, if I could have Edith's time and just share some things about the McKinley schools. Well, yeah, I've kept the time ago and you Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I just wanted to um, quickly share um, the McKinley Schools is a group of three schools, three sites. It's a day school for students that have emotional impairment and an IEP. The majority of the students have reading and literacy issues. They're majority black and Latino young men and boys. Um, it is an equity issue, if there ever was an equity issue in BPS. Um, we wonder sometimes if the commitment to equity anti-racism, uh, if there was a legitimate equity um, priority for the district, this would be the school system to start. And this is the schools that have been left at the end. Um, in 2017, their school was meant to be demolished for a new Quincy Upper School. Um, and right now, the Quincy Upper School has plans for a new state-of-the-art facility. The McKinley has a study, a plan for a study for a building. So you can again see the disparities that happen. Um, currently, the South End site has no gym, no cafeteria, and their bathrooms are crumbling. So there's really no need to have a study on whether this building needs to be replaced, um, but that is what has been prioritized both by the city and by BPS. Um, I just wanna add that 
and the impact of closures on students and families is much larger than most people think. Um, for students, this is their whole world. The reason they go to school is because of their friends, it's because of their favorite teacher, um, and to just willy-nilly close a school destroys their entire world. And I don't think that's ever taken into consideration when these decisions are made. And, um, you know, I think there's dog whistle terms such as like personal commitments, um, making hard choices, and those things really just fall on families and school communities to figure out how to make it work. And that is ridiculously unfair and has gone on for too many years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Um, yeah, so I'm going to transition over to Allison and just and let me just reset while I reset this timer here. Just wanted to acknowledge that earlier today we had a hearing around um, housing issues and I see housing and education very similar, especially when it comes to displacing children and the traumatic impact, especially for young people students who are already housing insecure to then be school insecure it's just creating further harm um, and trauma in our in our children and we have to really center the impact and um, to Ruby's point yes I take my orders from the people who who um, I work for and it was through their advocacy that we ended up in this space so I want to thank um, Barbara Fields in particular who reached out to our office and asked us to create space for this dialogue to happen so um, Allison, you really do have five minutes, though, because all this time has been eaten up. Okay, <laughs> go. Um, I'm Allison Friedman, a summer Sumner Elementary mom. Thank you for holding this hearing, Councilor Mejia. Um, I'm here to advocate for the Sumner, but honestly, my youngest kid is in fourth grade. She's almost out of the Sumner. So really, for me, this is about a fight to make sure that the merger process and any big decision-making process in BPS is better for all kids and families, um, especially since Green New Deal is rolling out and there will be lots of changes happening. Um, so a little bit about our merger process. On May 24th, Sumner families got a cryptic email about a facilities meeting two days later. In that meeting, BPS announced that Sumner and Philbrick would merge and spread across two buildings that are nearly a mile apart. School committee was scheduled to vote on this merger a few weeks later. BPS was definitely planning to just announce this merger and move on. Um, there was no long-term plan for where we would end up eventually. And the parents were all very concerned because post-merger we would be such a large community that there would be very few buildings that would fit us. The whole way this went down led to a feeling of instability in BPS. And I'm not someone who's housing insecure, right? And for me, it led to a feeling of instability. They were proposing a major change, the kind of change that affects the intricate plans most of us working families have for drop-off and pick-up. Hearing about such a change out of the blue makes you wonder, as a BPS family, what shoe is going to drop next. This is the kind of thing that drives families out of BPS. On top of that, no equity analysis was done in advance. When we asked, they said that equity analysis is usually done later in the process to figure out how to mitigate inequity. This is unacceptable to me. Equity should be, not be an afterthought. It should drive our decision-making process from the outset. We eventually, as family members, did our own analysis, and it showed that out of the elementary schools in Roslindale, Sumner and Philbrick have the highest and second highest concentrations of low-income, BIPOC, multilingual learners, and homeless students. When you merge these two schools, you concentrate race and poverty. We have repeatedly, for six months now, asked to see the equity analysis, specifically BPS's own racial equity planning tool, the REPT. We have not yet seen any part of it. Dr. Granson, who's here today and is in charge of equity for BPS, referenced the REPT meeting in a REPT in a meeting in November and said that BPS is in the third stage of the process, engaging stakeholders. But how do you engage stakeholders about equity if you don't show us your analysis from steps one and two? Dr. Granson also acknowledged that our own analysis, which we had sent to him, showed inequity and said that, you know, sometimes logistics make inequity impossible to avoid, to avoid, so we might need to mitigate that on the back end. 
But in my mind, the district has failed to prove to us that a more equitable merger wouldn't be possible. They assumed a particular number of classrooms in the building we will move into. But shouldn't we design our buildings to create the most equity instead of letting the building design compromise equity? We also asked for student rather than classroom level enrollment analysis, and we have never been able to get that. Um, one of the things that I'm going to shrink here is that I think that the whole, one of the problems for me is the way that the community is engaged. We have asked repeatedly for community meetings with our full community, and we have had one, one full community meeting since May 24th. And that means to me that we've had to get information by emailing, phone calls, trying to plan small meetings with different people from BPS. That privileges people who can do that type of work, which means that we have a group of upper income moms, mostly white, who are doing this work. And I, that's not a power that any of us want to have. All of us would prefer that BPS engage regularly with our entire community. Um, then Superintendent Skipper came in this fall, and there has been a somewhat of a change. Um, she says she wants parents involved in vision, and she wants us engaged. That's great. She slowed down our merger decision-making process. It won't be voted on until the spring. Um, BPS has, has now proposed a long-term long plan for the Sumner and the Philbrick. Long-term, we will reside in the Irving Building, which is scheduled to be renovated starting in June. BPS gave us an option of merging right away and living in the Philbrick and Sumner buildings or merging when the construction on the Irving is done. This means she heard what we were saying and wanted to minimize transitions. We are really grateful for all of that. But the equity analysis is still outstanding. We didn't want the equity analysis done just so that we could get a building that we wanted. We wanted the equity analysis done because equity is important. Um, and if we are doing something that is inequitable, what is the mitigation going to be? Do we get an extra ELL support or an extra family liaison because we have so many multilingual students? We also have some current building issues. The Sumner currently has seven kindergarten classes. Philbrook has two. They are all running full or close to full. So when we merge, we need nine kindergarten classrooms. The schematic design currently has six kindergarten classrooms. There's no health office. We've brought all of this to the attention of BPS, and they don't seem very urgent about creating a meeting since we have not heard one, and it's been a month. Um, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm trying to be really super mindful of like allowing people to go yeah. over, but there is definitely rules and, and structures yeah. in terms yeah. of how we do things, and so. I'm a working mom. I totally get yeah, it. I'm trying, and also I'm also <laughs> trying to be really super mindful of yeah. The allowances that I'm allowing people to, to go over, even though I said we weren't. Yeah. Um, because voice is important. And what's the sense of waiting this long to have your voices heard and then to be censored, right? So um, I understand what it's like to be in your shoes. So, um, But I am, when you start seeing this, it's like, come on, we're going to get through this. Um, so thank you. I am going to um, move now to some of the folks that we have um, joining us virtually. We have Brenda Ramsey, who's a parent leader at the Shaw, which is down the street from where I live, and um, you know, really in support of a lot of the work that you all have been doing in that space. Happy to have you here, and thank Ruby for making uh, sure that you had your voice heard. So, Brenda, you also will have five minutes, even though you're virtual. Don't think you get extra time. All right, go. Will do. Thank you. Um, I hope to be in person. Um, but I have fallen ill, and I apologize for my appearance. They are fixing my windows, so it is very cold in my house. Um, I want to just start by saying I'm the, the typical parent, right? I'm a working mom. I had two children at the shop. One of them aged out in third grade, and the transition to another school did not go as planned, and she struggled, therefore I had to make the ultimate decision of pulling her out of the district. Um, and I imagine that if promises were upheld for the Shaw, that she would have been there through fifth grade. And unfortunately that was not the case. For my little, who was in second grade at the Shaw, this is the only school that she's known. Um, and we are that family that has struggled with housing insecurity um, 
And it's because of the Shaw that I can say that I'm in an apartment where my windows are being fixed. Um, they have truly been the community that one can dream of their kids being a part of in education. I also work in education. I work in the district. So I understand firsthand, you know, the state that the district is in right now. And I am so at ease when my kid gets on her bus to go to the shop. And not many parents have, you know, that experience. The Shaw is more than a K to three school. Um, and I can sit and I can talk about all of the logistic things that all of you all have already talked about. But the biggest thing for me is being an alumni of BPS. I went to Rock West Roxbury High School. I graduated from there and my children were and are BPS students. And it is extremely hard when I sit and I listen to folks from the district say, we value parent voice. Um, but I spent nights prepping my daughter, who was seven, to testify in front of the school committee. I listened to the previous superintendent get on a Zoom with our school community and say, I had no idea why all of these Shaw families were testifying at school committee which to me was absolutely unacceptable. And I think it just goes to speak to how out of touch I feel BPS is, and in some cases, the city of Boston. Do not tell me to have a seat at the table and then pull the chair from under me by making decisions that don't include my voice. My daughter has been at the Shaw since K-1. This is the only school that she knows. This is the school she plans on finishing out. I've been through one closure already when the Matterhunt went through their turnaround status and closed and became an early learning center. And Councilor Mejia, I definitely agree with you. It was a very traumatic experience and it very much reminded me of wondering what apartment I was going to pull into, whether it was going to be my mom's house, my sister's house, a friend's house, because we didn't have one of our own. And so to turn around and finally have some stability in housing, but feel like the one place my kid felt at home is now being taken from her is a struggle. And every day we have these conversations and when flyers come home about meetings here and there about the school, all she says is, I don't want to leave my school. There are a lot of things that need to be done within the district, and I think the first one is honesty. We're human, right? And so for me, there are a lot of things that have not been answered. There are a lot of things that have not been told to us at the Shaw community. We were promised to go back to a, a, a K-5. to and there has not been a clear reason as to why that's not sustainable. Why the sudden push to merge with the tailor? And again, you know, I appreciate, you know, the, the young lady that went before me with the results of the Sumner. We at the Shaw haven't had that. So we're constantly asking questions that we too never get the answers to. We ask for modulars. I understand why modulars are not feasible, but I don't understand why we can't go back to a K to five school, which is what was promised to us. And so without going into all of the logistics and the stories behind broken promises, which is in writing and it's out there for everyone, my biggest thing is communication and honesty. Like you said, schools are often second homes for people. My daughter's school was a second home for me. Going through COVID, going through, you know, trying to work and have my kids in remote school while, you know, sleeping on someone else's couch was not easy. And then working with that community who have become very much like family for us, it's hard to know that that is, is going to be torn apart. There is no way to take the feeling you have when you walk into a building and spread it across two buildings in such a quick time span. 
there are a lot of questions that are unanswered and I appreciate being able to sit here and have this conversation. But I think it needs to be more conversations like this and they need to center around family voice because we're the ones that have to live through this. The folks that have the BPS badge that sit on, you know, the facilities team or this team or that team, they're not living through it. They're giving directions and folks are following and we're supposed to just roll with the punches. After a while, you get tired of being punched. I'm that parent. I'm so tired of being punched and being told what I'm going to do mm-hmm. when it's my child's education at stake. That's right. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Y'all heard that. And before we move on to the next person, I just want that to really sink in for those who are tuning in to the administration, the city staff, city council. Like, we have such a, a, like, we have an opportunity to really change the way we do business and to really understand the impact that the decisions that we make today in the city, on the council, at BPS. Like, families are, are hurting, right? And the only way we're gonna really repair trust is if we walk in this, acknowledging the harm that we have caused, mm-hmm. leading with that, and making a commitment of doing things differently. And while I do appreciate the Green New Deal, being guys, that's something really sexy because green is in now, everybody wants to talk about it, because who's gonna say no to green buildings, right? Oh my God, yes. But we cannot just put a new label on something and feel like the trauma that has been cause to families is going to be stepped to the side. And I know, knowing the folks that are in this room right now, that we're going to do things differently and our families are counting on you all to move in different ways that center them and their pain. And I'm very encouraged by that. I'm going to move on. John. You've been in my chamber before. I am literally going to give you five minutes because everybody's gone over and you're going to have to pay for it. Okay? I'll try. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Counselor. My name is John Mudd. I'm a founding member of the Boston Network for Black Student Achievement and a member of this coalition and a grandfather of a child in the Boston Public Schools. Barbara Fields isn't feeling well today and asked me to make a presentation in her place. No one can substitute for Barbara, as you know. She's unique and irreplaceable. We all hope she feels better soon and will bring her wisdom back to us as soon as possible. Barbara and I have worked on opportunity and achievement gap issues for many, many years. She asked me to talk about that racial equity planning tool as it's used in developing equity statements. A long time ago, we developed something called the uh, achievement gap impact statement. We did that because we had seen that under the achievement gap policies that Boston was implementing, they did one size fits all. And in that sense, uh, the achievement gaps actually increased rather than decreasing. And so we said uh, there needed to be an impact statement of, uh, of on achievement gaps that would show how blacks and Latinos would improve faster than whites or English learners faster than non-English learners, or students with disabilities faster than those who are not in special education. Under Colin Rose, the Achievement Gap Impact Statement was adapted into the equity statements we see today with instructions to develop these statements by using a racial equity planning tool. Let's be clear, we're talking about equity, which means how does each marginalized group receive the instruction and support that it needs in order to have a fair chance to succeed in education and life. That This means that there must be different strategies to meet the needs of each group. It is not equality where one size fits all. The Build BPS Green New Deal Coalition has reviewed many equity statements involving facilities that might include grade restructuring, mergers, closures, new instruction. In none of these equity statements, was there analysis of the issues specifically facing blacks, 
Latinos, English learners, or students with disabilities, or the impact of the proposals on these groups of students. So there's no misunderstanding. I want to read you the exact language in the instructions. Now, step two, it says, quote, what does the data tell us about the current situation for black, Latinx, EL, and special education students? And further, how will the proposal impact black, Latinx, EL, and special education and economically disadvantaged students? I repeat, in none of the equity statements about the facilities or other proposals, has there been an analysis of this data or the impact of the proposals and an explanation of the logic of how and why blacks, Latinx, EL, and special education students will succeed? All too often in BPS, we get good language, but lack of implementation. Given this history of failure to authentically develop and implement equity statements, there should be, there must be, a moratorium on any further school mergers or closures until there is a fully developed, comprehensive, district-wide master facilities plan with an authentic public equity analysis of its impact overall and for each of its component parts. U.S. City Councilors should insist on this and demand that BPS follow its own instructions before proceeding further in implementing the Green New Deal for BPS. Too often, these equity statements that have been produced are a cover or a camouflage for decisions that are made behind closed doors. That is a perversion of the concept of equity. Don't let it continue to happen. We are about to go down this road again. BPS has hired the DLR group to develop a master facilities plan. They will begin community engagement meetings in January and February. Will this be genuine parent and community engagement in the decisions that will be made about school closures, mergers, construction, or will we again have the semblance or show of involvement while the real decisions continue to be made behind closed doors? Please use your power and influence to make sure that the doors are open, to make sure that the real questions and options on facilities are brought to parents and the public for their genuine participation in the decisions affecting our students, our families, and our communities. Insist on it. Three seconds over. Oh, good job, John. Mm -hmm. Give it up. The only one who followed the assignment here. You understood it. Thank you. I do appreciate that. I am going to switch things up a little bit. Normally, we go straight to the, um, uh, the administration, and then we end with public testimony. But I really like to lead in the spirit of allowing people to speak first. So we have three people who are signed up for public testimony. Um, uh, if you have uh, signed up, I have Rachel, Mike, and Mike are in the building. Uh, you could line up there to speak. And then we have two people who are joining us on Zoom. I'm going to allow for two minutes during public testimony. So, and then we're gonna ask questions to you both. So don't, so to the community panelists, um, you're not gonna leave. What we're gonna do is hear from the administration and then I'm gonna have my council colleagues do a round of questions for both panel, okay? Because I really do wanna create dialogue. Um, so, um, I'm going to ask, Actually, you know what, that's not fair because some folks may have not wanted to stay here that long. I'm gonna do the public testimony, allow my colleagues to do, I know, uh, questions to the community panelists and then move on. I saw that, I saw that, I felt that energy over there, I got you. Yeah, and also it's not that we don't want to. I know, I know, it's just because we, we wanna make sure that people are planning, pe people are planning their schedules around being here and I wanna make sure that we honor that process. So, uh, two minutes. Okay. Start off by stating your name and the neighborhood that you live in and your affiliation, go. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rachel Young. I'm from Rosendale. I'm also a Sumner parent. And I would just like to quickly reestablish some norms. I saw that there was a lot of what I would call note passing among the BPS staff. I would just ask that you put down your computers and your phones and really listen to us. I feel like our voices aren't being heard because you're needlessly distracting yourself. So if you could please put away any devices you have open right now so that you can really hear us, I'd appreciate that. My testimony today is in regards to BPS's Green New Deal and the proposed merger between the Sumner and the Philbrick and the lack of authentic engagement to date. 
I'm one of several parents that has repeatedly reached out to BPS's operations division to discuss this merger and foster more open communication between BPS and Sumner parents. Unfortunately, since our outreach efforts began in earnest in July, we still do not feel that BPS has successfully engaged our community in transparent and collaborative conversations. The operations division does not promptly address comments and questions from our school community. I cannot say this enough. This office cannot, but more infrequently seems to choose not to, provide the facts and data that have led them to conclude a merger between our two schools is the most economical, the most equitable, and the most logistically prudent decision. Despite multiple queries, BPS has not shared the racial equity planning tool related to the proposed merger. Even though they first approached our community in May about this merger, email records show they did not begin to draft the racial equity planning tool until September. I have now written two separate public records requests and four appeals in order to access this report. Only for BPS to argue that this information is privileged. In speaking with the city's public records officer, it appears BPS is not fully complying with the state's public record law and has not provided the public records officer with the information they are required to do, again, by law. Second, the operations division is not simply uninterested in authentic community engagement, but the operations personnel is in fact extremely disrespectful and dismissive towards us. Meetings are proposed only to be routinely canceled at the last minute and never rescheduled despite multiple requests and follow-up. I have been disinvited to a meeting with the operations division a mere 30 minutes before it was supposed to take place. We have been, we've had a working group of Sumner and Philbrook parents and staff. That, meet, that group has only met once, even though we've asked to, to meet again. In conclusion, BPS and the operations division is fostering a dysfunctional and toxic culture of opaque decision making, frustrating the very parents that are ironically its fiercest supporters. Please take note, we are the biggest supporters of BPS. We are the parents that strongly believe in equitable, quality public education. We are the parents who send our children to the quote unquote least desirable schools in our neighborhoods, who champion its teachers and their students. Yet BPS, and specifically the operations division, does not recognize our efforts to date, our contributions, and our worth. And I admit I should not be surprised. It's really only competent public servants that value the greater community offerings. BPS operations is dysfunctional, as evident by the abysmal conditions of our schools. At the Sumner, there is paint peeling from our ceiling in the multipurpose room. There are hand-drawn exit signs above the doors in our preschool classrooms. These are obvious examples of neglect, and we very well could be the next school to be condemned. But more importantly, these unaddressed building defects limit our potential and prevent our school from truly functioning and blossoming as a school that it should be. For example, just yesterday, I had a conversation with the EEC about getting a license for our school so that we could offer vouchers to our after-school students. But because of the above-mentioned issues, that would not be possible. We would not pass the inspection by EEC. I've testified to this effect repeatedly in front of the school committee and repeatedly emailed the superintendent, but I feel that today I have not had these concerns recognized. And so I'm submitting my testimony to the city council in hopes that you will be our allies in demanding that BPS and the operations division reform themselves so that we can really have the Green New Deal that everyone wants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are, I'm really, so, I, so two minutes, okay? I'm gonna try to keep you all, cause I'm being really gracious here, y'all. In a minute I'm gonna stop being like, nope, mm-mm. Um, put it in on mute, really. Um, two minutes, I, I really do, you know, I'm going out of order here by creating space for public testimony to go beforehand, cause I don't wanna hold you hostage, but I need you all to work with me and keep it to two minutes, okay? Commitment, Mike? Commitment. Okay, Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Go ahead. Um, my name is Mike Prokash. I'm a uh, Codman Square resident, constituent of uh, Councillor Worrell, um, father of a BPS graduate, a member of Boston Climate Action Network, and of FAMCOSA, BPS Families for COVID Safety. Uh, we've heard um, demands for no mergers before there's a full equity analysis, a facilities plan, and we want to add um, modern heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems in the schools that students are moving into because they're critical to learning. They're critical to health. Uh, BPS's policies this year for COVID safety are not doing their job. 
Uh, there are five times as many infections this year as last year. We still don't have a commitment for uh, pool testing and mandatory masking after the holidays. Um, uh, rates more than doubled after the Thanksgiving break. Um, we need protections for everyone in the school, not offloading responsibility for COVID infections onto families, which is more or less the current policy. Um, if, um, if these merges occur and students are moved into buildings without modern 21st century ventilation systems and heating systems, the buildings aren't ready for the move. BPS isn't ready for the move. So um, I could go on, but that's the bottom line. I am also curious to know in uh, BPS testimony whether um, the Irving in particular is going to have a full, you know, whether it's been modernized uh, because 75% of BPS schools do not have uh, modern heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. Students are taking tests when it's too hot. Uh, you know, you have to turn off the air conditioners to hear the teacher. Um, it's time to change this scenario. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just on time, good job. Okay, you and John are winning the award so far, all right? So I'm going next to the next mic. Um, literally, you are, I'll let you know when you have your timer set. In three, two, Thank sure. you. Okay. Uh, I'm Mike Ritter. I'm the father of two BPS students. One is at the Lee Academy, which is one of the schools in the proposed Dorchester possible consolidation plan. I live in Dorchester's District 3 now, but Councilor L still my counselor. BPS needs community trust to succeed, but often plans are made without community involvement. Promises are broken. Deferred maintenance seems to have been BPS's facilities master plan for the last 50 plus years. And it shows with more than half of the buildings built before World War II. I hope school communities are listened to in meetings like this and we find the best path forward. Inevitably, new and retrofitted schools will be part of that path. So maybe BPS, I could help translate a bit for you what BPS parents want to hear about school buildings, which could increase parent buy-in. Tell us there'll be ventilation and AC and there won't be mold. Tell us each room will have its own temperature control. Tell us when our kids are inside our schools, they won't roast on hot days or need winter coats on cold ones. Tell us our children will be healthier and learn more due to these improvements. This will only uh, happen with modern HVAC in all BPS buildings, whether new or retrofitted. So tell us what is the very minimum we can expect in every BPS school from the Green New Deal. HVAC is 101 for any building in the 21st century, so the long-term facilities plan better have it in every single BPS school. The fact that parents in a rich city, renowned the world over for education, have to demand such sensible bare minimums in school buildings for the city's own children is damning. Boston, tell us you'll invest in public education like it's the essential public good it is, rather than treat it like an absentee landlord would. Give us, public, um, give us a public-facing, long-term, long overdue facilities plan run by a dedicated team with a real budget, listen to school communities, keep your promises, and deliver modern HVAC in every single BPS school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I really do appreciate um, your testimony. And I think that it, for those folks who are listening to community, you know, you're getting the answers in terms of what we should be doing differently. So I'm hoping you're taking those notes and ready to lean in um, and lead with that, you know. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go on to, we have one more testimony virtually. I see that we have Lauren Peter, I believe, us, another parent from the Sumner Elementary School. Uh, you will also have two minutes, and then we're gonna move on to Councilor Kali questions for the panel that's here. Lauren. Hi, thank, hi. can you hear me okay? Yes, you have the floor. Okay. Right, thank you so much, uh, Councilor Mejia, for holding this. Um, we really appreciate our advocacy. Uh, my name is Lauren Peter. I'm the chair, ad advocacy chair for the Sumner Family Council and parent to a third grader. I'm a Roslindale resident. Um, when these mergers were proposed, we reached out to um, the other schools that BPS proposed to mer merge in the Green New Deal. Um, and I'm so glad that this is being addressed in this room with the Committee on Education. Um, I really feel that this needed to be um, met and, and addressed here um, because we really, uh, as many other people have said, feel that there's a supreme lack of transparency. 
Um, so uh, one of the first things that I wanted to talk about is that parents are visiting schools right now. The showcase of schools was last weekend. Um, and I consider it a little bit more than disingenuous that nothing has been decided about our communities long term while people are ranking their school their uh, list of schools for kindergartners. Um, we're also entering budget season and while we're in transition, we believe that our community should be held harmless. The lack of transparency, the extreme missteps that were that were taken with our community and the Philbrick community um, required the process to be halted and re-examined under Superintendent Skipper um, will likely lead to a drop in enrollment. Um, we know that with a new BTU contract, teachers such as ours who are trained in special education and inclusion will be in high demand and we should not have any adjustments to our great teacher workforce that would lose any of this and that would lose us any of this valuable human capital due to short-sighted budgetary constraints. We know that BPS is headed in a particular direction. Um, they want larger schools um, for better budgets. We also feel like we're alone in that knowledge. We look around at the other schools in the area and talk to other parents and wonder how transparent BPS is with this information, with their desire to merge communities. Um, in this meeting, where several communities' concerns are being addressed, how many eyes are upon us? And finally, in our particular situation, when you're talking about a merger between our community of 538 students at last official count and the Philbrick community of 114 students, a great deal of sensitivity needs to be employed. We as the larger school have not observed that. In each initial interaction, We've a, there's been an impression that we at the Sumner have requested or driven this merger. This creates a combative relationship. We have worked hard and overcome this mis misapprehension with the people that we work closely with in the Philbrick Working Group, but I don't believe that this is clear to the entirety of the Philbrick community. I completely understand that the parents and teachers at the Philbrick love their small community and wish to maintain that. I feel that if BPS wants to change that, they need to own that responsibility. Almost done. At the Sumner. Just wanted to just give you a little time check. Okay. At, it's over at time, Sumner, but you got 30 more seconds, okay? Okay. At the Sumner, we at the Family Council work really hard to get all of our materials to our community in as many different formats and fully translated. We are normal people with day jobs and few of, only a few of us are multilingual. We're dedicated to making sure that the people who have extra time and money, people who look like me, are not the people making decisions about our community. We, we've asked BPS to meet us in this mission repeatedly with limited success. I request that focus groups be held in Spanish and Haitian Creole at the summer, having people at tables at pick up and drop off has, has been helpful us, for us in the past in reaching all of our parents, but our family liaisons are invaluable resources. I'll leave it there because I feel that, that is the most important point that you meet our parents where they are and that you reach out to all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And I'm sure that BPS and the city are taking fearless notes. No, just um, so thank you. Thank you for your input. I am going to close public testimony at this moment and I'm going to transition to counselor uh, questions. I know that we have um, counselor Louis Jean, um, then followed by Council Worrell, and then I'll ask a, a question or two to the community panel. And in the interest of time, we're going to do three minutes. Three minutes. Because I know y'all going to go to five, so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Um, I know that anytime we're talking about school mergers, we're talking about really difficult conversations. And for me, especially, you know, two of my schools have been brought up. I went to elementary school at the Taylor, uh, longest place I've spent um, any educational time from K-1 to fifth grade. Uh, my niece is there now in a sheltered English immersion class. Um, and I went to the McCormick. And so I have been, since I got here, I've been really keen on the McCormick BCLA merger, talking to um, the head of school there, um, lifting it, bringing that back to BPS to make sure um, that we are giving them the physical resources and spaces um, 
to, to actually execute upon the merger. And I know that we have not been meeting them on the very basic needs, like locker, very basic things like locker sizes for high school students. Mm -hmm. If you're at the McCormick, the, high, the locker sizes there are for middle schoolers. If you're going to be absorbing a high school, um, we need to think about, so like, just to, to say yes around everything regarding our, how we've fallen short for our students. Um, and it's beyond upsetting. And so I hope that, you know, we are able to take accounting of, you know, the, 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 our failures and really circle back with BPS about what it is that we need to do to uh, make sure that that merger specifically is one that uh, is really centered on the issues of equity and making sure that our students have everything they need. Like the gym isn't, the, there's issues with the gym. There's just like so much going on there. I would like to hope that a lot, that when we have the master facilities plan, which I've been told is coming out this spring and hopefully we'll have it um, for the budget season, that we will have a list of what all of the schools do and don't have, uh, including HVAC. So shout out to Mike Ritter. I know that you have been um, on this and every time, uh, Deputy Superintendent, any time I've asked a question about uh, HVAC, I've been, I've been invoking Mike. Um, but I think that will be really important for us to also see what our schools don't have, what our schools must have, and what we're doing to make sure that all of our schools are getting everything that they have. And, and I will say that I think BPS does need to fall on the sword up to date with just how poorly we've do, done in terms of communicating with parents, full transparency, what we know, what we don't know. But I, I am also encouraged by the new communications um, team at BPS and believing that they are trying their best to communicate, um, and we're not, not all the way there, to communicate um, why these mergers are happening, specifically around um, the PA Shaw and the Taylor School. If there are other reasons that we're not announcing besides facilities, regarding why we need to do this merger. We believe that this merger will result in more academic success for our students. If that is part of the equation, bring that to the fore so that we can have that discussion. It doesn't help to not have that centered and rooted in the discussion if that's part of it, right? Because if you're telling me that my niece is going to thrive uh, m a lot more as a result of this merger, let's put that out there and let's talk about it. And I think having these conversations, even when we don't have all of the answers, is a really important part of, in terms of like building that trust and transparency Transparency. Um, I can understand why folks are upset to this date. Um, and, and I'm not saying that I, we, we are going to have to deal with trade-offs if we really do want to talk about what our each student deserves, especially our black and brown students who have, been, who have historically not been really centered in these discussions. Like every student deserves to have a school that has a functioning gym where they are able to also participate in arts classes. I was at Fenway High School uh, two weeks ago and they're trying to scrape together dollars for gym for, for, for a proper gym facility. And so I, I, I do think that like part of the discussion here is we are doing these mergers because a lot of these schools lack the things that we believe every student deserves, regardless of what neighborhood you live in, regardless of your parents' income. and. Um, and because we think that we will net better educational outcomes for all of our kids as a result. And I don't know if that's always communicated. And it's often done, it feels like things are being done to our communities rather than alongside them. So it is really incumbent upon BPS to create uh, a lot of space uh, for folks to, to really understand the full methodology, the full thinking of what we're trying to achieve. Because I was at the meeting last week at the Mildred about the um, Taylor uh, Shaw merger. And my staffer was at the Rosendale meeting three weeks ago about the Rosendale mergers. And I think that it's, um, you leave each meeting with parents um, and community members saying, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what the plan is. I don't know what the vision is, what, what this merger is going to be. And I think it's incumbent upon B BPS also at these meetings to set the stage at the beginning of what the goal and objective of the meeting is so that people aren't like left mystified. So like it's not a meeting that's gonna solve all the problems, but we wanna lay X, Y, and Z out. And so my hope is that BPS is getting a lot better at communications and with some of the hires I believe that it is um, because we have a lot of work to do to build trust. Uh, I wanna see my niece thrive um, at the Taylor School if, if it's a 
Taylor Shaw. I want to see her thrive and all the students that thrive. And I just don't think that community members, parents, um, teachers have what they need to really trust BPS. I'm sorry, the timer went off. I'm sorry, Council Twice, Lydia. but I'm just being um, generous. And sorry, I don't and think I had a just pointed question, seconds, but if anybody but they, wants to respond or they react, do. feel yeah. They do. I have both lights up, so okay. I'm just, I'm going to, you know, Ruby and then Megan, and then we're going to move on to uh, Council Rorau. I just want to note that what is not being talked about is kind of, you know, the generational trauma of what happens when your school no longer exists. Oh, yeah. Right? Exactly. And so I think with these decisions, you also have generations of young people, like at the McCormick School, who have now, like, left and had to fight tooth and nail, didn't speak English like how to come and give testimony at school committee to fight for their school to stay open. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the part that goes unnoted. I think the other layer is the poor planning of um, not just the school committee, but our staff and BPS. Um, currently, there's a lot of talk about right sizing the district, when in reality, there's also an inclusion rollout that calls for classes to be about 12 to 15 students. Right, so how do those two things converge, right? If these plans are to close schools, because we know that historically that's what they are, right, where is the, the accounting for the fact that you'll have to have more space for these inclusion programs, right? And Ethan is here talking about inclusion rollout. He knows very well that at the Manning it's about 12 to 15 students per class. Right, so we're gonna need that space, but there's no accounting for that. It's a matter of closing schools, right? And it's a matter of, for example, like having to ask families to make trade-offs. When in reality, like currently, we've been three years into a pandemic, we've had zero HVAC systems installed. In fact, the Jackson Man had one of the newest HVAC systems, so you're actually at a, like a negative right, for HVAC systems in this, in this system, right? So these are not trade-offs that families are making, they're just having to live with them. And so I think that's part of like the anger and frustration that comes with this, is there's no acknowledgement of the generational trauma that this is causing. There's also an exchange that happens in terms of the rationale behind the middle school is that there'll be less transition, so that'll be easier for students. But in doing that, you're causing more transitions for the current students, right? And so where is the accounting for that? Where is the rationale behind that? that you're supposed to have less transition in order to have more transition. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. And I think the poor planning is what is not included in that. Thank you, thank you. And I wonder, Megan, if you had anything to add to just, what she just said, because just if it's minute, the same, I promise. yeah. Um, amen. Um, and I think that, that so often the decisions that are made about facilities are not ever based on educational philosophy and what is best educationally for our students. The de decisions around closing the middle schools, that was not a conscious decision made by the school committee based on any research. Never, ever at school committee was there research presented about that. Never was there research presented about grade configuration. The changes in grade configuration were implemented to satisfy the exam school configuration. And same for start times. It was not based on any educational philosophy or research. So that's, that's where we've been around facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Can I add a really well, quick thing? Well, you know, after that, I'm just going to, can you text them? I'm not going to make it to my. Um, I really quickly, just the, the schematic design for the Irving Building, which is now being designed for the Sumner and the Philbrook to go into, was designed without uh, the designer knowing who was going to be in the building. So we have like wrong numbers of classrooms. The classroom sizes are not up to MSBA standards for the number of kids. So we're, the, what you were saying about like accounting of what we have and don't have and the like lock of long-term planning, like had they decided who was going in first and then done a schematic design, that would have been more Thank reasonable. You. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Luigi. Um, Council Morrell, you now have the floor and you do have, uh, like I think uh, I, I, I made it really clear that I was really Madam trying Chair, to I'm gonna, I'll, thank I you. just want to say thank you, you know, to all our parents and our advocates that constantly advocate uh, for our young people um, for the betterment you know of the city of Boston in their future and I'm just hoping that BPS is you know just listening to these parents and um, these are the parents that we want into our community but because of the lack of transparency the honesty and the consistency and that the harm that we're doing with these families these are the families that are leaving yeah. um, and I think that if we're continuing down this road you know we're gonna 
um, be losing these families that are so important to our to our district. So I just want to say thank you um, um, to everyone that continues to advocate. Um, I, I am a big data person and a research person. I think that everything needs to be grounded and rooted in data and research and then communicated effectively to all our parents. Um, and even if we could communicate to our children on why these changes are being made, it's going to increase the amount of engagement that we have with our schools and that continued buy-in. So um, just want to make sure that you know we're listening and that that's the movement and we're trying to you know, be more transparent and communicate effectively to our parents and our students um, just to increase that buy-in to keep these families that are so effective to our Boston public school system because these are the people that are advocating for BPS. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we're working with them, working for them, and that when they're, when they're voicing their concerns that we're listening. So thank you again. Um, please consider me an ally in this work. Um, and if the, as Brenda Ramsey, if there's anything that, I know I have the list from uh, the families at the ones that, yep, well, it's just Sean Taylor, but I have, the, I have the list from the BPS and Rosin, though, those schools mergers. But if there's anything that's outstanding for the Shaw and Taylor communities, please reach out to my office. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're helping holding BPS accountable. Thank you. Thank you. And in the interest of making sure that community has a chance to respond, even though you weren't asked a specific question, there is still time on his timer that I'd like to yield to you all in the interest of the way that I wrote. Ruby, I know you've been at this, and Megan, everybody has been at this for a long time, so I'd love to create an opportunity for you to kind of like react to anything that you've heard from Council Rural, please. I think I'm more just hoping that the staff that is here actually makes an effort to do things differently. I think, you know, when, when people talk about right sizing the district and enrollment decline, they think of it as, you know, the, the solutions are easy, just closing schools. But in reality, you know, when we don't, when we talk about enrollment decline, there is a perspective of you could just provide what students need instead of looking at it as an opportunity to close public school systems. Um, for me, I find that terminology really offensive. It is offensive for our school committee to be saying it regularly without any thought about the impact that it has on families and basically them telling families that they're closing their schools as an afterthought rather than any kind of conscientious planning going into it. Thank you. Megan. All I would say is we would not be having this conversation if we were in a white privileged community. This is not how right sizing would happen and I think it's just um, mm. it's disgraceful and it's upsetting and it's over and over again. Thank, Thank you. you. Alice. Um, I also want to say that when we use enrollment as a reason to combine schools or close schools, we're always going to hit the, the schools that have the most um, community of color. Um, within Roslindale, the least chosen school is the one that has the highest number of kids of color. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reason we're merging the Sumner and the Philbrick is because we have the enrollment small enough to theoretically fit in the building, though actually when we've done our analysis, we don't know that we will actually fit. Um, but that we're always going to hit the same people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know I, I, y'all felt rushed, but I gave y'all a little extra time to breathe. I hope you appreciate that. But I, I'm gonna move into the, um, the administration panel, and as y'all transition, I'll just have a few of my own little um, commentary to, to add to this uh, panel. You know, um, I often talk about the fact that I grew, you know, I went to Boston Public Schools and I bounced from place to place and it wasn't until I was in the fifth grade that I stayed in one place long enough to make friends because my mom and I had housing insecurity, right? So those are the reasons and the conditions in which I had to bounce and move around. But that impacted my academic outcomes as well. Um, and I think there's something to be said with housing um, instability, school inst instability, and what it feels like to be a student and not know whether or not your school is still going to be open next year. And I think that there's, there's a level of accountability that we need to take in terms of how we communicate and how we engage families so that they understand from the get that you are listening to them and really validating the concerns that they have experienced. And I know the whole entourage is coming here through, but I'm gonna actually name the folks that, the way I, I'm gonna switch things up a little bit. So I want Rebecca, um, Charles, Miriam, and Sam. And then I know that, Ethan, you're here to answer questions as well, from what I understand? Yeah? 
uh, also speaking. Oh, y'all, th okay, come on through. And if you think that I was like that with the community, imagine how I'm gonna be with y'all. I'm gonna be like, no, y'all got three minutes each. <laughs> I did communicate to Chantal that this panel was going to be a total of 20 minutes, so you guys have earmarked your time accordingly, right? Yeah, we'll speak um, together, like not as separate things, but as one. Plan. As one voice? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. All right, so my hope is, is that as you speak in this one voice that you also keep in mind of the voices that you have heard, right? And while you may have your own PowerPoint, I mean, your own data points that you wanna share here, I really wanna make sure that those who have been tuning in and those who have spoken before you feel like you've, they've been heard. So that is the request, is that you weave into your commentary what, um, or some of the things that you heard here, how you're gonna address some of those things, right? Like, we've seen these PowerPoint presentations because we've been in all of your meetings, right? So my hope is, is that this time that we focus together is that we respond to what we have heard and have um, know to be what is the constant um, thread about people feeling like it's an afterthought, that you're not being honest, that things are always being done to us without us, and what we're gonna do differently. So as you continue to talk through, know that those are the things that I want you all to be mindful of. And Ethan, in regards to the comment that Ruby made, in regards to the how that's gonna look, sure. I want you to speak specifically sure. to that. I don't want, I really want to center this conversation on what you just recently have heard. Okay, is that fair? Okay, so we're going to begin with Rebecca, and I'm gonna time it, and we definitely are on time to start now, go. Um, instead of the individual timing, is it possible to do the full 20 so we can pass back and forth? And you have already started, yes? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Councilor Mejia, for sponsoring this hearing um, and for bringing us all together. And, um, you know, we very much understand that this is an important conversation and um, we're glad that we're all here. Okay, I realize I can't turn from the mic, but this feels weird not <laughs> talking to the people who have just spoken, but um, I wanna thank all of the community members for also being here. Um, I, knew, I know that I'm one of the uh, newer faces that you're seeing. I can't turn and you can hear, can you? Okay, I'm watching you on the back of my head. Okay. Um, I, I very much hear the um, distrust and the hurt um, I am grounding myself in the history of all of the things that have come before, um, and we are working diligently to come together as a full team so that we can do this differently. Um, you know, I just want to speak for just a moment on the Green New Deal, just to say that this is our shared commitment to ensure that students have access to learning spaces that are safe and healthy and energy efficient and inspiring. I wanna say that piece um, because I hear that in the reflections that the community just shared. Um, and we share that commitment. Um, and I realize that sometimes the path to getting there feels different and we wanna share this together. Um, but I do wanna recognize that we're grounding it also in um, those equity pieces. Um, I'm jumping through some of the pieces to, to more address people like you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, um, on our, I, I think, so, so we've got the Green New Deal, right? And we're moving towards the long-term facilities plan. And in conjunction to that, there um, is that we are asking certain communities to hold this with us and to move prior to this long-term facilities plan. And the communities that are represented here today are communities that are, we're asking to do with that. Um, so today as we're speaking, we're talking about a couple specific mergers that are on the table and that we're here to discuss. And we wanna be honest and upfront about those, but also a part of this long-term facilities plan is that other communities will be included in um, these transitions to combine multiple school communities. We know we haven't figured out uh, the way to fully do this well yet, and we're um, hearing the communities 
that are the people that are here um, expressing that to us, and we're working to come together as a full team to do that. Um, and then I just want to say on this panel today, you're going to hear from community engagement, equity, operations, and academics, and that both the houses of uh, BPS are working to be united and uh, we're also being more united across the city of Boston, and that means the mayor's office and the public facilities department. Um, I'm going to leave some of the other pieces and pass it on to Sam to talk a bit about the operational okay, pieces. Okay, wait. I'm going to pause. I've paused your time, just so you know. So I know because I haven't been on this council now for two and a half years, I've already been in spaces with BPS in hearings before. And what I know to be true is that you all already come in very prepared to speak on specific issues. And I really do appreciate Chantel working alongside you because we got questions that we submitted to you all from the advocate so that you can come here prepared to ask, answer those questions, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to add another challenge, right? I already disarmed you without PowerPoints. Now I'm going to like add one more thing to this little situation here, is that I really want you all to speak from your hearts. Now that is going to be a little bit different because that's not the norm, but I really want you to bring yourselves into this space because what I've been hearing from folks is they want to understand that you understand them. And it's hard to believe that I'm being understood when I don't feel like our voices are being validated. Okay, so I'm just gonna push you a little bit more. And this is just a prelude to how the hearings are gonna go next year during the budget cycle. All right, so you can get that practice now. Okay, Miriam, I'm gonna resume. So actually I'll be jumping in. Um, thank you, Council Media. <laughs> I also want to also um, personally thank Ruby, Allison, Megan, and all the other community partners that spoke here um, this evening. Um, we have been listening and taking copious notes on the side. Um, is that better? Thank you. Um, I also just want to name that um, in keeping in the spirit of the space, I also want to say that over the 23 years I've been in the district, um, this feels different in the sense that we're actually taking the time now to actually do some reflection both internal to BPS and external to BPS with the community around what's worked and what didn't work as far as engagement goes. Um, we've been thinking a lot about that over the last year. We've been really listening to a lot of our um, community and our um, advocates and really trying to understand how we go forward with this work um, moving forward. So with that being said, we spent some time understanding that we need to make sure we got our house organized and that we're all working together. So I'm optimistic with the partnership that we see now with internal to BPS, with the different departments that are collaborating more than we've done in the past, working more closely with the mayor's office, um, superintendents on board with the sense of urgency that we have to act now with a lot of these prog um, programs in um, um, developing this master plan, and more importantly, with your partnership and the council's partnership as well. Uh, because um, we appreciate you all being at the table um, in all the different engagement sessions we've had. And we've also listened and heard that communities want to host and be part of actually hosting this engagement sessions that we have planned to inform the, the facilities massive planning. So in our last launch off meeting, we talked about inviting CBOs, partners, parents, community groups to really volunteer to say they want to host a session. They can help us shape it. They can help us run it. And we'll go show up as participants. So we've heard the community. And that's the direction we're going in. So we're excited to also put industry standards in place around how we do this work that was that has not been in place um, in, over the years that I've been in, in, in the district in some of my many roles. Um, so as, since I've been in the role, we've um, working with our team created our internal dashboard that's going to help inform some of the projects. That dashboard that we created that was announced last May um, was really instrumental in us identifying which project could be launched immediately, including the McKinley's um, work, including the by stadium um, support that we're doing. So we've actually understood that we need to get ourselves organized. Next, we also understood that a lot of the work that we were doing prior was not to industry standard according to school districts. So we've really worked closely with our Council of Great City Schools. We listen and learn from other school districts about how to do this work. And we're confident that with that information and armed with that information, we've positioned ourselves to move forward in, in a direction that's going to get us um, um, some, some better results. Lastly, with this design study, it's important that we also understand what our schools need, what they look like, 
um, and take the time to really listen and plan that out with our academics department, with our um, different program areas, with our multilingual learners, with our special education department, and really understand what sc schools should look like, ought to look like, and, and feel. And um, I'm confident that with all this work that we can move this in a direction that's different than before. So I just want to thank everyone for their participation, thank everyone for their voice and advocacy, and we are listening. Um, it's a matter of us transitioning to a point where we roll this out. So as we do this work together in this new way, hopefully that trust will build and we'll see some better progress in the future. With that, I'll turn it back over to Rebecca. I want to note for the record that one of the questions that we submitted that we want you to answer at some point in this um, is in regards to, um, you know, why were some of these six schools uh, being asked to merge before the completion of the, uh, the design study? And I also want you to um, answer, uh, you know, are they getting new facilities? If not, are they getting it from the merger with other schools? For example, neither the Shah nor the Taylor has a gym. So if, these, um, if we're merging these schools into the same building, um, that won't give them a gem, right? So we kind of want to understand the framework that you all are using for um, making some of these decisions. There, there's 39 questions that we asked. I'm not sure how many are going to get answered, but I just want to make sure that I'm going to be holding myself accountable and making sure that as you all proceed with your comments, that there's going to be some answers to the questions that we submitted already. So I'm going to go back on the timer, and someone is going to pick back up on that, right? Because that's what that's that that was what we talked about. That I was going to we were going to set you guys up for success. That we were going to send questions, and some of these questions may not be there. Some of them I know are. So I just want to make sure that you guys had a chance to look at some of the questions. Yeah. Yeah, so that's some of the answers we um, answered in our comments. So uh, we can go back uh, to the 39 questions is a lot for the 20 minutes we have, so I know we're going to get Oh, no, because that. I feel like I missed it in yours because you do operations, you oversee a lot of this sort of stuff. So I'm just curious who can answer it. Yeah, so as, as we roll out and have the design team conversations and we discuss um, what the schools would look like, ought to look like, feel, and get that feedback from the, from the field, we're going to need to do some work to figure out what spaces are available once the um, merges uh, are landed in the way that we think it work, and then determine what's missing and figure out how to plan for some of those amenities to occur. So the idea is to have the conversations, figure out the best way to make the folks fit in the building. Once everyone's in place, according to what um, programmatic needs are available, then we can see what spaces we need to modify to do any additions or build on to any of the spaces. So it's, it'll be a process of first getting people in the building, understanding that they in, they're in the space, figuring out what's missing, and then developing a plan to build in or out, um, depending on the space that's available. Thank you. And Don't I'm going to me. assume, hold on one second. I'm going to assume that, Dr. Granson, you're going to talk about the racial equity tool that some folks have questioned as to whether or not it exists and how it functions. So would you be able to dive into that? I'm going to go resume at the time. And then I'll go to you, Rebecca. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, thank you uh, again, Councillor Mejia, for, um, as was uh, stated earlier, for uh, convening the panel. And thank you to the, the panelists um, for um, just the, the wisdom and the history um, and for continuing to hold us accountable. I will say for um, the work that we're doing uh, in the Boston Public Schools um, over the last few months, uh, echo uh, my colleague uh, Sam uh, DePina in that this does feel different. Um, and I think for um, the, um, all of the advocacy and the, the panel earlier, uh, again, continuing to raise these questions actually uh, makes it easier for me to do my job uh, internally. Um, it's important for us to stop and slow down. Um, when we are, uh, there's so many people who work very hard um, in uh, BPS uh, who are very committed and passionate about the work. And I think that um, we have a history, as was shared here today, of jumping right into the work um, and then coming in and asking afterwards. And we're trying to unlearn those behaviors and set ourselves up for success um, and our students up for success by changing some things structurally in terms of the way we do work. Um, and so some things that are different um, are that my members of my team are at the table with, uh, for these conversations. Um, we are uh, trying to do sort of a reset from the spring and the prior history and uh, the summer really 
uh, made the commitment to make sure that we're using the race rapid planning tool throughout the process. We can't go back in time uh, and fix what was not done, um, though we can commit uh, that from this point forward um, it will be a part of the process. The ideal, I do want to acknowledge what was said earlier, the ideal is that we do it at the very beginning. Um, there may be some circumstances, though, when that can't happen, so I do want to acknowledge what was shared earlier that I did share at the um, community meeting at the Irving um, that I looked at the analysis done by the Sumner uh, Philbrick uh, parents, and um, I do think that, you know, based on those numbers, there will be a higher concentration of students with needs, um, and high needs and, and, and diverse needs. I think that that in and of itself does not have to mean that it's inequitable. That means that we need to do everything that we're supposed to do as educational leaders to provide the resources for those students to be successful. Um, and so I just want to reiterate that, that the concentration of high needs uh, doesn't necessarily automatically mean uh, inequity. Um, and so we are committed to continuing. Uh, I am confident in being able to say, and, and to be very transparent, I haven't always been able to say this over the years, um, that I've seen the, the race record planning tools uh, for these mergers, that we are uh, in process. Um, I do agree that we need to uh, share our work with you. Um, and so one of the things that you know, I've shared with my colleagues uh, over the years is, uh, this is just like when you were doing uh, fifth grade math and you, you gave the, the right answer and the teacher said, no, you, I need you to show your work. And so you need to be able to document how you got to the uh, answer. Um, and so um, one of the things that we're pushing uh, internally and we're getting a lot of traction with this um, under uh, Superintendent Skipper's leadership is our racial equity uh, dashboard um, that we're looking, you know, something we've been working on for the last two years. And so um, we actually, this is a good timing because we actually have a prototype of it internally and we're at the point now where over the next one or two months we'll be able to show and document where we are in every step along the way uh, for every racial equity planning tool that's active in the district. So before we go on to the next, and I know Rebecca, you are interested in speaking, but one of the questions that we submitted was given that the effort to create a coherent long-term plan by the end of 2023, how will decisions be made in the interim about facility changes and how will the larger context of these decisions be addressed, particularly regarding the racial equity of these decisions? Like if you did mention that, I didn't catch it. Yeah, yeah. So can at least you just answer or Speak address to that. that? Speak to that, yeah. Please. Absolutely. Um, and so I think the nature of this work is uh, such that we are going to have to plan and implement at the same time. And um, that is not a perfect process, but it does a call for us to do um, double the amount of engagement, more listening, um, and even, you know, what I uh, continue to push uh, in term as uh, co-construction. And so we need to have the community in the process with us in terms of the implementation of the building and the planning. Um, there are some things that were already from previous administrations um, and the previous work, as, as was noted earlier, around Bill BPS, that was already in motion. And so, you know, the, the example of uh, the fact that in Rosendale there's a building that's, that's, that's available, right, for that merger, but that's not the same for the Shaw uh, and Taylor, right? Those circumstances do create different experiences. Um, and what we have to do now is to do our best to try to move that, those, those mergers forward, but do it in a way where we make sure we meet the needs of the students. The mitigating strategies then means that, um, and I believe uh, someone uh, said earlier, does that mean we're going to get a, you know, um, a new position or uh, to support English learners? I think that might mean that. So when we talk about equity mitigating strategies, and to go back to what uh, John Mudd shared from Barbara Fields' testimony, um, the whole idea behind the race strategy planning tool is to say we'll never get, we're going to never have a perfect world and a perfect set of circumstances. We want to try to do as much as we can to uh, address the inequities, not cause more inequity. And so that means we have to be super intentional about the way we plan and make sure we put the resources for those who need it most. Thank you. Thank you for that. And just so you know, I'm going to probably add a minute or two since I've been asking questions in the meantime, only just because I want to be super intentional and utilize your time wisely too, so thank you for that. I know Rebecca, you wanted to say something and then we'll go to Miriam. Okay, I, I actually was um, thinking about how it would be important to bring Ethan's voice in after the earlier comment, in part because a lot of this has been centered on facilities, 
but uh, a core piece of this is also the designing for inclusion and thinking about how we're thinking about academic opportunities um, differently. So um, my comment was actually connecting with Ethan's work so that um, even in the buildings that aren't transitioning to a new building, we can think about what are the opportunities for kids. Perfect, so then let me frame that a little bit more sure. in depth for you so that you could follow yeah. this um, question here. Regarding the potential mergers of the P.A. Shaw and Taylor and the Summer and the Philbrook, um, would the racial equity analysis be done? Will an analysis include reviews of the number of students from different racial, um, socioeconomic status, special education, ELs, and how do they compare to the non-merging uh, school districts? If you could answer your question and address that within that framework, that'd be really helpful. Sure, sure, uh, it definitely will. And I think that I was just uh, thinking about some of the, the mistakes in the past that we often design these around. Uh, when we think about facilities, we think about the average kid or we think about a general education student and we don't think about the specifics of what a multilingual learner or what a student with disability actually needs. Um, and I was gonna say, the, the going to the contract, which I think sets the stage for our inclusion planning, that the recent contract we signed creates the opportunity for us to actually live up to our values. Um, because I know we're serious about serving our black and brown students better. Um, and right now we have too many of them in substantially separate classrooms, right? And if we're going to uh, serve them better, we need to make sure that they are not uh, stuck in substantially separate classrooms. We have two times the national average of students with disabilities in substantially separate settings. We also have very limited opportunities for those students to have partial op inclusion opportunities. In fact, we have half the national average of students who, have, who are able to do partial inclusion. So and in small schools, it's really challenging to have those um, opportunities for full and partial inclusive opportunities. So when you have larger schools, you have more flexibility and more resources to be able to design schedules that are able to serve IEPs. Um, and so that's why as we go into this, both at the Taylor and the Shaw at all the mergers, we wanna take all those things into account. So, I can go, can we keep going? Yeah, so can you just, Really quick, Ethan, are you going to keep going? Because I do want to Sure, add. I can, or you can ask. No, I'm just curious, you know, going back to in the near future, we're also going to have to look at um, physical. This is another question that we submitted, and I just would like for you to address it. You know, now due with the decrease in student enrollment, the district says that we have too much um, space and need to downsize and engage school closures as well, consolidating and mergers, you know, that whole conversation that we're having here right now. As a district, um, truly analyze the potential use of um, class size reductions, specifically mm -hmm. around social distancing, looking at um, physical and occupational therapy, looking at IEPs, the psychological services, et cetera. Like, how are, how are those things factoring into your decision-making process as it relates to um, this work? I can certainly speak to the special education and the IEPs, mm -hmm. and I think that over time, what has happened, we, a decade ago, we had 40% of our students with disabilities were in substantially separate settings. And when we're talking about substantially separate settings, we're not talking about substantially separate. Generally, those kids are totally separate. They don't spend time with their peers at all, right? And that's not okay. We're down to 30, just below 30% now, but we should be able to do much better. The national average is below 15%. Um, and that has facilities implications because all those kids have home rooms and those substantially separate settings are home rooms. So if we're trying to get kids out of smaller rooms and into the general education classroom, we're gonna have to think about where all those kids are at different times. So we're gonna have to plan for that very, very carefully. And are you gonna plan uh, for that through some racial equity Tool. What, what's your Absolutely. what's your what's your action plan? For well, planning? so I mean, I think we're that's what that's the planning process that we're engaging in now um, to make sure we get that right. But for example, um, our black males have I don't want to get too technical, but have a 3.6 risk ratio of being in a substantially separate classroom for emotional impairments. So that means they're 3.6 times more likely than any other kid to end up in that kind of a classroom. We need to plan 
to be able to undo that. And, and as you plan, I'm just going to um, encourage you to plan and build alongside folks like Edith Bazil and other people who are actually, 100%. you know, on the front lines doing this work and understand what it looks like um, from a number of different spaces and places. So I just want to offer that as something for you to consider that planning with and not for is, should be the only thing that you walk away and learning from this um, uh, opportunity here that we have for all growth here. So I just want to continue to encourage you all to think in that way. So I'm going to move on to Miriam. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and thank you to the panelists who were here um, before us. Um, I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Boston Public Schools. And the role of the community engagement team is to create um, spaces where we can ensure authentic two-way uh, communication with members of our school communities. Um, we do that in different ways um, because we understand that that work needs to constantly evolve, right, and adapt. Um, and so we also understand that community engagement is not just the role of one team, right? This is also the responsibility of all the teams that are involved in the decision making. And so my team provides different kinds of support, um, both to the capital planning team, but other teams that are responsible for um, uh, creating these proposals. And that goes from technical pieces to working with project managers, working with network superintendents, and school leaders who we know hold the closest relationships with school um, families, right? Um, and with our students on a daily basis, um, because ultimately we know that this is about relationship building. Um, and so part of our work is to also bring back ideas, questions, and uh, perspectives from community members back to BPS decision making. Um, we also want to make sure that BPS programs and policies are brought to communities in ways that are understandable uh, so that our students and families can fully participate in the district and benefit from all that we have to offer. And to that end, our team sometimes functions as a thought partner for other teams you know, to review materials, presentations before they actually go um, into the community so that we can clarify messaging, for example. Um, with regards to the merger proposals, um, my team supported the capital planning team um, both in the spring with uh, the meetings that were held. Um, we gathered questions, feedback, uh, to build the foundation for the continued engagement that followed. And then in the summer, there was a smaller group led mainly by network superintendents um, and school leaders who had smaller conversations with some of those communities. Um, and as you know, um, when Superintendent um, Skipper started in September, she proposed that in order to hear from more voices, um, we needed to slow down the process and you know, create more opportunities for engagement. So we've been involved um, in some of that work, I mean in that work. Um, we heard, I heard you know, loud and clear today that we have to do more of that, mm -hmm. um, that we need to do better. Mm -hmm. And we also know that there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes in order for authentic engagement to happen. Um, we make sure that um, all our meetings are accessible with language access. Um, we provide um, interpreters um, in all the languages that are needed. Um, and we're also trying you know, to not only do virtual meetings, we've incorporated some in person, but we know there's not one thing that will work for everyone, so we, we hear that and um, we're committed to doing that. Um, and I just wanna lift up that we heard that there's you know, a, an important dynamic that we have to um, embrace, that we have to hear from more people, especially from our most vulnerable communities. So to that end, we are committed to you know, providing 
in, in facilitating meetings that are either language specific, that are um, also inclusive of reaching out to families that have children with special needs to make sure that their voices are included in our meetings. Um, so I just want to thank both the council and everyone who is here to hold us accountable and um, I'm glad that we're here to have this conversation because we know that we need to do better and we're here for it. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. And just so that I'm clear, you were part of the creation of BPON, right? The I Boston, was, or you were the executive director? You, you I was the director of BPON for yeah. a period of time. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I am going to assume that because of the work that you did even before you stepped into the district, that you walk in, and you also worked for the city school, right? Absolutely. Which was deep organizing, right? Working with community. So I'm going to encourage you, mm -hmm. right? to bring that into BPS I hear you. and lead with what you know this moment demands. Thank you, Councillor. I'm encouraging you, you Go please. Please, bring it. I just wanted to reiterate that I do feel encouraged um, by a new level of partnership that I see happening, both between you know, folks from City Hall and BPS. Um, in this new wave of leadership that we have across the city. Um, and so I hear you, I embrace the challenge, um, and it, it feels good to go full circle, With you being know, you, that's seeing different you way. in that position as well. Likewise, that's why I know that we are accountable, right, to each other and to the people. So I know that my council colleague here, Kenzie, uh, Councilor Bach, I am going to uh, give you the floor. I know you have to step out at five, so I'm gonna let you go, and then I'll go. Thank, thanks so much, Councilor Mia. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be brief, because I, uh, I really apologize to the BPS crowd um, and to all the community testimony beforehand that I just showed up at the 11th hour of the hearing, um, so I, Often when it's this late, wouldn't come to a hearing at all, but I do just feel like this is such an important issue um, because honestly, I mean, obviously we all like really learned in the pandemic how not fit for purpose our facilities are on like a lot of really basic levels and I'm excited that you guys are doing the assessment. Um, and I really think, you know, I was thinking when um, you were talking, Ethan, that uh, there really is a kind of like Goldilocks aspect to school size. like. You know, I think we all know nobody sort of wants their child to be getting lost in a big school, like a kind of oversize or a sense that like they're just going to be like a, you know, a student number instead of a name or something. But then uh, on the flip side, I've definitely seen a lot of students and families who they really need that like specialized support person. And it's really hard for that person to exist in all the schools. And I know that since I started actually staffing for the council before I was a counselor, that issue of like the complete school and how we make sure that we've got all the support staff that our students need in every building in the district and how we budget for that like has been kind of the central like school budget question from the council's perspective every year, right? Because there are just so many things that we as counselors, and you guys have heard it year after year, we're like, how can every school not have a librarian? How can every school not have a nurse? How can they not have a, psych a school psychologist, right? And that's even leaving aside some of the inclusion um, specific specialists that you were just referring to. So um, like, I'm sort of, uh, I'm encouraged by the best version of this vision, right? Which is being able to tell people like, we're gonna come out the other side of this with really complete BPS schools. Um, that not just have great physical facilities, but have the kind of full complement of support services, um, language supports. Like, I just really feel like for our huge number of BPS students who are bilingual, um, having, like, knowing that there's more than just, like, one teacher in the building who can speak their language um, is super important. So, so, I, so I know, I know, like, we're trying to achieve a sort of Goldilocks thing here. Um, I guess just... Like, you, you have a line in your presentation, you say this plan will have a clear timeline sequence of projects and cost estimates. I kind of just wanted to really like land on that point and if you guys could just expand a little bit on how, like, because I'm, I'm thinking about like this process for each, the, the two processes at the, you know, in Rosendale and the, um, 
the other one um, for the Sean Taylor that you've given us decks on here. Um, and I'm just thinking like, these school communities need to know that you've heard like everything about them and how to serve them. And then they also need to like really know what the trajectory is. Like when are, like, when are we gonna be able to deliver like X, Y, Z facilities and like when is everything gonna happen and how's it all gonna add up? And, and one piece like, one piece I'm a little concerned about is just I feel like we have all these pots on the stove, like all these different studies and projects and like how for a family do those things actually get threaded together and then I think it's going to be really important to project manage the hell out of like actually delivering so that families don't feel betrayed in terms of what facilities become available to them then when. So I, I'm sure that you guys spoke to this a bit before I came, but I just, I would love if you'd speak to it now because that's kind of a, I, that's a dominant concern of mine is you guys have heard from people today and you've heard before, like there's a definite sense people have of sort of like broken promises in the history of the district. Obviously, it can't be the case that the district never makes promises again. Like, we need you guys to make promises, but then we need the district to keep them. Um, so, yeah, can you speak a bit to that? Sure. Um, I'll first speak around the intersection points, and then I'll speak to kind of how we structure the intersection points in a way that's transition proof. I'll get to that. So, um, sorry, thank you for the reminder. Um, so first I'll speak to the intersection points of everything and then I'll talk about how we intentionally street, set up those inter intersection points to avoid any transition problems that may or may not occur. So what we found historically was that there's been a lot of transition and, and in those transitions some work gets lost, some work gets dropped in um, implementation plans uh, sometimes are not fully, um, fully implemented, if you will. So what we've done uh, going forward was making sure we first understood what we needed by industry. So this facilities condition assessment is just an industry school district standard that other districts do. It's live, it's ongoing, and we need to have one established. So um, that work is due to be complete um, in the springtime in March of uh, 23. So that'll be complete um, in, in fairly short order. So that'll be wrapped up. Once we have that information, um, that is gonna help inform um, the work that's done with the design study. The design study is underway. We just launched it, um, and that's due to be complete by the end of 20, 2023. So what we'll be doing in the meantime is really having the engagement sessions, listening to what um, uh, the community says around what school design should look like. Then once that's complete, we'll have the FCA already done. We'll merge the analysis that we do with the FCA to this design study work, then together those will help inform how we um, design projects in, in, in different scenarios that may exist. So it'll really start shaping up, I would say, by the end of 23, we'll have at least all the information together and then we'll be able to form kind of how we go forward. Part of the work is um, also looking at some case study modeling that we'll do along the way. Um, but also understanding what our current needs are based on the inclusion work that we need to do and other programmatic needs that we have to implement, the strategic implementation plan and work that, we do, that we're doing with DESE, all that work has to still continue. Work that needs to be done in buildings will have to happen, so if there's an emergency in the building, any maintenance that we already have planned, those will be ongoing th during this time period as well. So you're right, there are a lot of moving pieces, but the intersection point would be towards the end of 2023 where we'll have more information um, on how we go forward. Got it. I, I have follow-ups, but I think I'll, I, can, I can send them after. <laughs> well, and was anybody else going to say anything on that? Just, I guess, I guess just, so, right, and I, I guess, um, do you think that the, in terms of these overall macro studies about, like, what a K to 6 needs and what a 7 to 12 needs, like, how are you feeding in? Because when we had the contract hearing, we talked a lot about the major new inclusion goals that you guys have and the way the contract reflects those, and I think that's super important. It's both a statutory requirement of the city and also something we should be doing for all of our learners. Um, but I guess like it feels like you need to know a little bit more of some of the inclusion models that you're trying to build for the contract even this year to know what a standard K-6 to needs. So what, how, does, how does that exact threading happen? That happens now, so a lot of the, um the goals and targets and initiatives that we're rolling forward 
will help inform um, those conversations. So some of the things that are just non-negotiable that we have to implement will be part of the conversations and planning now as we talk about how to implement that, what it looks like. Um, and then by the end, all those pieces will be taken into consideration um, um, once we start doing some more um, case study planning work uh, as we develop all the pieces that need to happen. So the inclusion work, the Office of Multilingual Learning Strategic Planning work, all those pieces will be embedded into that design study. I mean, in many ways, it's, it's all the same work, right? And it's important for us to see it as a coherent piece of work between the Green New Deal, implementing inclusion, reimagined funding, school funding project, uh, and the multilingual learner strategic plan. Those things are about what do we want our schools to look like and what, do they, what does every school need to be able to do, right? And that's changed. Um, and so, and we have to be able to answer to that question. Great, thank you so much, Madam Chair. That's right, you're welcome. Give me more time than I wanted to. Um, yeah, so I, I'm gonna switch things up a little bit. I did advise and give the uh, administration, or oh, our liaison, uh, the heads up that I was gonna switch some things around, right? Because normally what we do is all the you know counselors ask questions, but I really do love to lead by community and show what is possible when we really give up our time and space for those who are living the realities and really trying to push the work. So I'm gonna ask the community panelists to come for those who are interested. And you're only, and I'm not, uh, look, the goal is to be out of here by 515, so don't think that y'all gonna have a whole rodeo. I hope that you are each are just coming here with one question. And as you all make your way, I'm gonna make my closing remarks, okay? Um, so I, I think it's really important for us as we, like at least for me as, as the chair of education and as someone who has graduated from Boston Public School, am a BPS parent, I am deeply committed, right, to this conversation and making sure that BPS gets it right. Because if we don't, it's a reflection of all of us, right? So I'm holding myself accountable to that work and working in partnership with you all, right? So yes, I'm always pushing y'all. That's my job, right? My job is to, ensure that we are doing everything in our power to ensure that we are delivering for our students. The fact of the matter is, though, that we all know we don't need a study to tell us what a quality education facility looks like. We know that, right? So to hear the hurry up and wait and we're gonna reset and restart. Fits and starts, it is definitely, as Megan has already quoted me, feels like an abusive relationship. And you get back into the cycle of violence and abuse. Now we're getting sucked right back in and we're being asked to trust and, and believe that things are gonna be different. But in order for us to really believe that things are going to be done differently, then we need to change the behavior in which we're operating. And so if people are asking for us to pause and slow down and create a real structure that leads with community, then if we're doing this trust building exercise, then what would be the best thing to do is to pause, slow down, do things in ways that people feel that they're being done with, not for. And then we're hiring lots of consultants who are getting lots of money to do this work. And I believe, as I said in the rec equity roundtable discussion that I crashed yesterday, is that some of those dollars could be invested in parents and paying parents to do that work. But every time you hire consultants and people with titles, and know how what you're saying to us, and I say us because I am one of them, that we don't really matter. That we're bringing in the experts because they understand design, human design, central projects, blah, 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 blah. But families know what this looks like and feels like for them. So I would again urge you all to look at that consultant budget and figure out how we can invest in families and create opportunities for them to co-design a process that is truly reflected of the community. That would be, to me, 
a good faith effort in showing that you are ready to really step to the side and create space for families to really lead. Those are my closing remarks, because you know I gotta run out of here. I got a mock trial that my daughter is going to need therapy because I'm not gonna be there on time. Mm -hmm. But I am going to close us out um, and create space for community to really have the final word. You have an opportunity to ask any of our um, esteemed panelists one question. That's it. So pick that one question. Y'all don't know who's gonna be in the hot seat. I, ha I just made this up as I go, just so you know. I don't know what's gonna happen. I just prepped everybody with that. Go. I have a question for Ethan. Will the standard class size in the new Green New Deal be 12 to 15 students for inclusion classrooms? Uh, we haven't determined that yet. Uh, we don't know. But that would be a very low number, I would say, just to manage expectations. Isn't that the number at Manning, approximately? No, it's not. We have two teachers with 26 kids, a teacher and a para with two teachers, uh, and 26 kids at the Manning. Hmm. Grades uh, three, two through five. So when will that number be determined? Since you're building, it will the depend. Ship while the you're class in the sizes water. in the inclusion model will depend on the concentration of need at each school. Uh, and so if you have a higher concentration of need, you're probably going to have a lower class size, right? And if you have a less concentration of need, you may have a higher class size. And uh, so it's those not, studies are, are completed determining No, that? They are not, they're not completed yet at all. The inclusion planning teams uh, have been launched in about 30 schools, uh, and they will be working on their school plans. And then I think we're also through this budget cycle trying to understand what we're going to be able, what is going to be a sustainable model moving forward because we don't want to have uh -huh. a budget, uh, you know, each school shouldn't have their own model. Uh, it needs to be within a set of rules and yet you also want to make sure that schools are able to meet the needs of their kids in the building. All right. You see how, Ruby, I let you have five questions in one. I see you. <laughs> Look, you act like one of my colleagues, all of them, including me. All right, so Megan, you have one question, one question only, and make sure you're ready to bring it. Oh, you all say that this feels different, and I appreciate that, and I would say from this side, it doesn't feel different yet. Um, I think what we need is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, honestly. <laughs> Um, my question is, Dr. Granson, you said that we, um, we need to plan and implement at the same time. My question to anyone on the panel is, can you give us another example of where this happens, in, where else this happens in public planning or in other communities? And if you can explain why this is necessary here and now. Is that a question for me? It's for anybody Anyone. on the panel. Yeah. Uh, I don't have an example at the top of my head, but I think that that's something um, I commit to go back to, to look for. Um, it has been my experience, though, in, in K-12 education um, that, that's, that that's the reality. And I think that a number of things have been, a number of things have been put in motion. Um, and so going back to the decision to um, eliminate middle schools, right, we have an opportunity to provide a higher quality educational experience for young people um, in Rosendale, in that re region, um, it would be it would be a it would be a loss if we were just to leave the building sitting there, right? And so the idea from there is, how do we capitalize on that opportunity to provide a, a higher quality learning experience for students? And and I went back to I go back to sort of what I said earlier. That's not the case in every place in the district, so that, that means that, that we do have to then take creative strategies because it's not going to be the same across, um, across the entire city. Um, but we do, then do have to go back to what Councillor Louis John said earlier, um, figure out what the trade-offs are. And I hear it loud and clear. What I, what I hear loud and clear, my takeaways are the co-construction. I also heard loud and clear just now. It doesn't feel different on your side. Uh, and so. That means that as we go back and reflect uh, as, a, as a team, we're hearing slow down, even pause, even moratorium. Um, we need to be more clear about why we believe this has to happen now. And I think uh, a, a large part of that is the more delay that we get and 10 years from now, we'll still be having this conversation. 
right? And, and then we'll have even worse outcomes for students and worse opportunities for students. But I do hear a lot of clear, we, we need to co-construct and not, not do it to folks. That's right. And I need, oh, you think you're gonna talk, Sam? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Go ahead. I was just gonna briefly say that in my experience in the past, when we slow down projects and, and try to really take our time, it really impacts the kids that are currently in the district, and it, it does more harm than good, in my opinion. So okay, thank just you. Note that. You know, I don't know why I embarked on this exercise, but I just feel it's so important to end with community. So I just want to say thank you to the administration for allowing me to do something like this is unorthodox, but I think it's we're trying to do new things. Allison, um, you now have the floor. Yeah, speaking of the things not sounding different, I keep hearing we're in process, we're in process, but I've been coming to these meetings since 2017. Um, so that is hard to keep hearing. Um, so I want some really concrete answers. Mr. Grant, Dr. Granson, can you share the REPT right after the meeting? You have my email address. Mr. DePina, can you, Dr. DePina, can you, um, uh, can you get us a meeting with public facilities department so that we can start looking at that schematic design together the first weekend week in January? So I'll briefly answer. Our goal is to have the design meetings actually start next week. So when the meetings start next week, there's communication going out this week about that. So you'll be able to have those conversations in the design team meetings next week and have this next few months for us to have these conversations. And that's on the record. That's on the record. Okay. And I commit to pushing my colleagues to expedite the, the RPT to the point where it's appropriate to be shared publicly. Absolutely. Yeah, and so I'm going to ask, not that Allison did, but I will just throw it out there as the same level of urgency in which we're moving in, that we also look at the Shaw. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I do appreciate, you know, all the advocacy. I want to make sure that no school is left behind. Okay? So... I'll advocate for them. Um, but I, I wanted to thank my uh, additional colleagues that have joined the council <laughs> um, for, for participating in a rapid round of questions. I hope you felt comfortable, and I do appreciate you all just going with it. Um, and I, I do hope you know, right? Like, I, everybody knows how I am. Some people love it, some people have an issue with it, but I do hope you know that I'm always coming from a place of trying to move the work forward. Right, and that we have such an amazing opportunity right now to move differently and leading with people and being super intentional about what that looks like and holding ourselves accountable to that process is what I'm committed to. So with that, I am going to keep this um, hearing. And the only reason why we did this hearing today was because Barbara Fields emailed me and said, we need to know right now what is happening with all of these schools. And because she asked for that, we did it before the end of the legislative cycle. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the conversation ends this legislative cycle. We're going to keep this in committee and bring it back up. And what I'd like to do is like every quarter, do a check-in. What did we say that we were gonna do here? What did we learn about the work that we said we were gonna embark on? Because the only way we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to the people is if we could come in back here and answering their questions. So just know that there will be another meeting, another hearing um, in the next few months to just look and see how things are going. So for now, this meeting, this uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you.